Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we explore the art of improving existing software with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations overcome the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, Jimmy Kuppel, who is currently the CEO of Mirden and CEO of Up to Speed. Jimmy joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. Jimmy Kuppel. Welcome to Maintainable. So as you reflect on your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, well-maintained software? Sure. So for well-maintained software, you obviously have to start with what is the goal? The goal of a software is almost always to be used for some purpose, whether it's standalone as part of or as a library for other software. So it has to work. You don't say that, sounds good plain, like, oh, I've got to get working. But then we have to look beyond that as to like everything gets away between delivering value, not just today, but in the future. And so you can look at its external qualities, like it has to be understandable, and also it has to be evolvable. And those those cover a lot of things. Like when you say it's, it has to be evolvable, it doesn't mean like I can change it, but also means it's easy to change to the right thing and hard to change to the wrong thing. Because that brings in questions of robustness. So, so I can go for this a while because I actually quite recently wrote about this topic. I have a blog post called The 11 Aspects of Good Code. And, and I, so I encourage any listeners to check that out. The 11 Aspects of Good Code, they want full detail in very poetic language. But I'll just say one more thing from there that I think not a lot of people think about, which is what a programmer is doing is that we turn thoughts and ideas into into reality by code. And there's a kind of big process in which your thoughts become reality. And actually, people in the program synthesis community have, since the 60s, kind of formalize that and try to figure out how can you get a computer to replicate that. And a really big insight is that a single thought can affect many, many pieces of the world and the and the code base, and well as artifacts out of the code base. So a really great aspect of great code is that you can make the system do as much for you as turning the thought into code. Some of my examples, it's like, so say you want to implement dark mode for your website. Do you have to go to 10,000 places and put the thing closed over and over? Mm-hmm. Do you have to go up to a few places and put the closed over and over? But what even better, which is very rarely if ever done, is if you would actually just say dark mode and you actually have a mechanism that kind of infers a palette for you and puts in the shadow it needs to be and maybe adjust the size of things because colors and how large things needs to be interact. And if you can do that, then you're in programming bliss. That's an interesting example because can you think of other examples that don't feel like the, the dark mode aspect, like there's a general, like there's probably some patterns you can follow, like design guidance there to like be like, okay, there's using a certain color palette. These are kind of the, let's say that necessarily the inverse, but something that's going to work in a different context. It's like an on or off type switch thing. But I would imagine most developers aren't necessarily approaching challenges that just have kind of an on and off type of mode like that, or there's some sort of invert. I don't know the best way to describe that, I guess, in sort of like a toggle like that. Do you have another example? Sure. So one that comes to mind very easily because it's an exercise in our course is so there's a very famous piece of code from, I believe, Quake 2 or Quake 3 called the inverse square root, which computes 1 over a square root of x, which is very important to number of physical calculations, such as lighting. And so there's a very famous code snippet that looks like absolute magic. And and like it does this weird stuff with like converting the float to an int and then doing some bit shifting and um, think handing it with this really weird constant. And like, you can try to reverse it. And like, there's a whole Wikipedia article on this, the fast inverse square root. And you can figure out that it's actually is doing like a quick estimate and like one round of Newton approximation. But I want to focus on the magic constants. Like, there's a really weird constants that it uses there. And how do they come up with this? And the answer is that, well, it's like some approximation lets you solve for something that's almost optimal, but you can search nearby for things that's actually optimal and test it and you can test along a side and large number of n- number of the possible inputs to realize this one choice of constant pick you the best thing and so that is a very large thought process that goes into that single constant which is just there to the extent that you have this entire Wikipedia article about this five line function and so so question we give students is how do you embed that more in the code and the answer is that so what if instead of checking in as your, your source this magic five line function what if you like took whatever program you wrote to find the optimal constant to use there, because I'm sure there's a program, and you check that instead, generates the constant, and that's your true source. You also mentioned like 
how trait of maintainable code is that it's evolvable. And you mentioned that it's easy to change the right things. And but it's also, I'm assuming it makes it more difficult to change the hard things or the, the, the things you don't want to be. Yeah, I said the easy to change it to something else that works and hard to change it to something else that doesn't work. And can you share an example of like when you wouldn't want to change something or where it's kind of intentionally hard? Sure. So if you have a program that crashes when you pass negative numbers, it'd be very nice if it was going to be blindly obvious, like when that can happen and when your variable is passing the negative number. You could have a fancy type stem that has separate um, integer and positive number types, or it can just have certain variable naming. It's like, hmm, like I have a variable called milliseconds and I have another variable and it's passed to a, a function which takes a keyword argument called difference. Actually, wait, let me take that around. Let me reverse that. I have a variable called a time difference, and I am passing it to, to a, like a keyword argument called time elapsed. One of these sounds like it's always positive, and one of these sounds like it could be negative. That should stand out. And in fact, something where you use keyword arguments, it's much more likely to be caught in code review versus positional. So that's an example of making it harder to change something that doesn't work. Very simple. And how do you kind of weigh up when you know, we think about something you, you'd also mentioned, and there's a couple of other things we'll dig into related to the article that I had read that you had written, related to, you know, has, the code needs the work to be worth, I suppose, being maintainable and to some extent. Where do you kind of delineate? Do you have a common definition when you're working on projects or how you talk with your students taking your courses to think about what their definition of done is? Like, what is that? Because you could keep polishing and massaging code where's that line for you it's not the thing we talk about a lot it's like code is never done you know the, our, every project has its huge backlog and then half the field of product management is just pruning that backlog for things that are actually important so i don't know much to say there it's like do you need new features do you have do you want new features and do you want to fix bugs if so your code's not done it was in terms of like is it is the current objective or the ticket you're working on the feature enhancement is it done enough as a code base that you can move on to the next thing, knowing that the code base as a whole isn't done, but in terms of like this particular objective is seemingly done enough that we don't need to keep optimizing this? So I'm not sure I really understand understanding your framing and context. Um, plus, and it, oh, so like I'm hearing like, is the code base done? Which, you know, the question is the code base done, which I'm transferring my head to is the product done? Like I, like, I don't know if you're asking me, it's like, like, oh, it's like, um, you know, there, there are things like, oh, it's like, I, uh, mm, I wrote this feature and it works, but it only works with people who are under 100 years old. Do I need to fix what, is it done or not? Like, there are questions like that that I think are mostly not interesting. Like in that case, like if you're, that's an example, like if your feature only works with people 100 years old, you probably did something stupid and, sh and you shouldn't have stupid things in the code. That's probably are causing other problems. I think it more in terms of if you're working on a piece of software, a piece of software where the end user is, or the customers or the client that you're working with is requesting some functionality improvements. And there's a gray area about where, how far you go when there's like managing scope for that particular feature. And so you might say, it needs to work for the 100 year old person, step away from that example, but let's say, we need to add some functionality that's going to generate an invoice. And so you get the, the part where it generates an invoice, the code quality that can drastically differ uh, in terms of like, when do you decide the invoices are being created, but is it, at what level is it optimal enough to consider this good to move on and we can come back and, and iterate on it later versus there's a question about whether the feature is done. There's a question about whether the code is acceptable for checking in. Yes. So these are two different questions, hence some of my confusion earlier. So on a Spruix, so every project has different needs and standards in terms of code quality and depends on a lot of things. You can probably think of five of them on the top of your head. And different parts of the project also different standards. I tend to think that most people have their standards too low, or even if they want to set them higher, they wouldn't know how to raise them. So I can't tell you what the number of factors that people may don't, maybe they try from the counts, but they d don't do it properly. That would tend to push the standards up. So a really big one is that, so first someone has to read that code, like your viewer or yourself in five minutes. And there is, there's kind of a huge gap between like the code, what the code looks like, I just kind of like English, like I just wrote down, make, make invoice, make fields, and then the thing lays it, lays it up for me and makes them flow versus like 
know, draw these boxes or even like put down these fields, then when they click this, get this value and put it here. And so there's the huge range in terms of how much you need to mentally translate the code into into thoughts to read it and vice versa to write it. And I think people tend to not realize just how beautiful you can make it. And when I say beautiful, I don't mean like, oh, hey, I'm like painting. I mean, like, it is pleasant to work in this code base. I do not need to spend effort. I can do very interesting things very quickly. So the, the fact that you can have code that is an absolute pleasure to work with, I think many people just never reach that. And so that will tend to lower their standards. And another thing is... It is actually is quite predictable how much a particular piece, the quality of a particular piece of code will impact things going forward. And you can look at code as a graph in a number of ways. And so they're very direct things like the relationships like this function calls this function, which means that, you know, if you were to change something in that function that changes what kind of values it expects, that it changes its callers, you know, that creates costs for changing that thing. Then it connects in other ways, like we have a certain name convention, or there is a place, it's all over the code that we're assuming that images are on the same machine in a folder with this name, and you can look at where the assumption spreads. And you can write that assumption that assumption that images might be a certain place instead of the same machine, that's like not a single place in the code, that's kind of down the side, but it's connected to the code in a lot of ways. And so you get this whole graph structure of every idea and thought an assumption that went into the code and how it's connect they connect to each other into the code. And the trained eye can look at a program and see those connections. And that tells you that lets you predict quite well the the cost it will it will be to change something, as well as how much someone will need to read this going forward to understand something and change other things. So based on this graph that you can learn to see that it does a lot to tell you the long term consequences of not of leaving the code in a messy state. Hey folks, it's me, Robbie. I want you to take a moment and close your eyes. Now picture your code and your application as a symphony. Now to keep that symphony playing smoothly, you need an orchestra of tools. That's where our podcast sponsor, AppSignal, takes center stage. They combine the elegance of error tracking, the precision of performance monitoring, and the harmony of logging into one symphonic suite. Whether you're composing with Ruby, jamming with Elixir, orchestrating with Node.js, or harmonizing with Python, or maybe even a little bit of flourish of JavaScript, AppSignal's got the sheet music for you. And here's the crescendo. Plans start at just $23 US a month. That's got to be music to your budget's ears. Plus, they're certified ISO 27001, and they dance the GDPR and HIPAA compliance beats. So don't miss a beat, my friends. Head on over to appsignal.com and tell them that your good friend Robbie from Maintainable sent you. Now, open your eyes and let the symphony of smooth coding begin. Let's get back to our show. You know, I know that in your article, 11 Aspects of Good Code, one of the topics you touched on in there was that good code makes it easy to recover the intent of the programmer. Could you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Like I have, like, have a general idea about it but for listeners in terms of thinking around, like trying to understand like why something was there, but like maybe what the rationale or in your words, the intent. So I think this kind of theme has been talk, mentioned a number of times today. So this refers to something called the embedded design principle, which I first publicly wrote about it in my blog post from I think 2018, 2018 or 2019, my favorite principle for code quality. And so this goes back to the idea that there is a logical process by which your own thinking and intentions, as well as facts about the world, the environment and assumptions get translated from high level, translated from high level intentions, low level intentions to plans, to details, you know, to your intentions, specific code blocks, all the way down to the individual lines, all the way down to the to the white space. And I'm going to step back a bit and quote from a great book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It says, like, a motorcycle has the idea of a drivetrain, but there is no part of the motorcycle labeled a drivetrain. It's like mm. there's there's actually not even a part labeled transmission. There's like, you know, it's like specific gears and cams. And yet yeah, you need to understand this idea of a drivetrain toward a motorcycle. And so as you're, you know, as you're tightening a screw in a certain place, which you're like, what you're really doing is you're operating not only on the concrete piece, but also on the high level structures which are composed of patterns of pieces for some bigger goal. So 
is can hmm. on this one level be tightening a screw on this level saying you're, you're fixing the drivetrain. And so this happens hmm. in code as well. It's like if you're describing your task to someone, you will not say, oh, well, I am, you no, know, I'm replacing these five lines with, with this one line. You might be saying it's like, you know, I'll say I'm replacing this uh, specific instance of something with general functionality that it does it. You know, I am, you're not saying, well, I'm like deleting all these braces and moving these things around in this fashion. You might say, well, well I've extracted a common, a common superclass of these common piece of functionality. And so always when you're working in code, you're working in higher ideas. And so there's a lot that can be done when the code is closer to those ideas. Mm -hmm. So one example on uh, thing actually, I wrote a long Twitter thread at the end of last year based on, I went and walked an MIT class and kind of gave a guest lecture doing Korean code review, so just full of examples. So think of the code like, you know, like new date dot time, like it's a current time, less than something plus 60 times 60 times 24 times three. And which if you follow that, that is 60 times 60 times 24 times three is the number of seconds in three days. Someone for, says, this code, you have to think about, I'm checking like if this time is within three days of this other thing. Then you have to translate that to like a time plus an addition. Uh, and then you have to translate then this to seconds and like come with the formula for computing. That's uh, the number, number of seconds in three days. <laughs> Thankfully, what they didn't do is actually do the multi put the multiplication in the code. The actual they didn't hard code that number of seconds, which oh my god, what well, I hope not many people have learned to recognize that. So it could have been worse. But like now someone reading that has to undo the mental process of seeing that thing, recognizing it as the number of seconds in three days, and then figuring out the actual intention. And like you can just have a small time comparison library unless you write like three days from now or you know, like yeah, like time like time dot now dot until this time plus days of three or something like that. And that makes the code closer to level thought. And now if you want to change the intention of like, oh, no, I don't want to check within three days, change check with change within four days, you don't have to do this, translate the code back to the thought, then back to mm -hmm. the code thing. It's just there. That makes sense. And the example also about trying to avoid doing something like just taking the calculation of seconds and just sticking that in there and being like, what was what's this weird wild number here that you may or may not remember? I don't know how many times I've ever seen like 86,400 in code and being like, how many was that? <laughs> so that it does pop up more than we'd like to admit. In that same article, you also mentioned something I was really curious to dig into was good code hides secrets. What kind of secrets are we talking about here? And do you want to share any personal secrets with our listeners? <laughs> no, it's because of secrets. That's so, uh, yeah. So, secrets is a term uh, which it's very closely related to the term information hiding, which that mm -hmm. I think has um, penetrated software engineering circles pretty well. And secrets, I think, would be recognizable to most academics, but, and it has penetrated software engineering somewhat. You know, not extent that encapsulation information hiding have, but they all come to the same place, which is their origin is some that work in the early 70s by David Barnes. So here's one of the stories that uh, spawned the idea of secrets was told in um, this article called The Secret History. It's a pun, The Secret History of Information Hiding. And it's about 1969 or 1970, David Parnas was working for Philips in the Netherlands, and they were working on an oper operating system. And he sees two guys, uh, Johan and, and Johan, having lunch. And one asks the other, it's like, yo, what does it mean to open a file? It's like, what do you mean? What does it mean to open a file? Like, you can't open a file, you can't read from it. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, tell me like, how it's laid out on disk. Because mm -hmm. I need, I'm working with compiler, I need to write the open function, or I need to check if it's. So the operating systems guy takes a napkin, starts like showing the bit structure of files. And David Parnas sees this and he like has a feeling that something is wrong. And he tells him this and like, they're like, go away, we're getting work done. And so this napkin take, gets taken upstairs, gets three hole punch, put in a binder and the compiler team, because this is a few decades before continuous integration was a thing, compiler team uh, writes their open functionality, assuming the files have a bit structure. At some point, that structure changes. They put the compiler mappings together. Lo and behold, they don't work. And so David Parnas was for a few years afterwards racking his brain and thinking like, well, what could I have told them? It's like they were, did need to get work done, but clearly like, there are consequences of, of this. And so the idea has come up with his secrets, which is you need to view, the line that I have is when you call a function, you're not calling that function, you're calling that function and all alternative versions of it that satisfy the same spec. So the files, like you're not building a piler to link with the operating system. 
You're not building two components linked together. You're building a compiler that links with anything in this amorphous space, operating systems that satisfy a certain spec. And like up for the operating systems pick like which version they're doing and how they're laying stuff out. But like they have some rules that they need to follow and they can do anything within that. And your thing doesn't really work in some sense, unless it works with all of them. And that sense particularly is like, if it's not possible to know your function works, unless you read 30 other functions and go like five levels deep in the stack, then there's a sense which it doesn't work, period, because it needs, needs to be able to work if you like only read the spec or the documentation of the things that you're using. So what, what they should have done in this case was say, it's like, all right, the operating system team is going to provide, they have some way out of files. You don't know what it is. You need to work with anything they give you. And they will provide some operation on that called open that you can call. And maybe you can try to inline that in. But if your thing is like making assumptions about certain bits being in certain places, and that's for this fragile, and that's not guaranteed, it's not a stable guarantee. And we we'll just say your program is wrong, whether even before you look at their code and see whether it works together with, with whatever they come up with the end. So here are the, the formats of a file structure is an example of a secret. Can you think of an example? Because admittedly, I feel like that kind of dove down into some low level stuff that my brain's kind of like imploding a little bit as I try to wrap my head around it. And that's okay. But for some of us people that work in software, just a different level of the stack, yeah. And where, you know, like I'm primarily working in like web development, you know, do some shell scripting, things like that as well. But like, can you think of an example of like a secret that you'd be like, well, I shouldn't know that much far down below, but I'm just trying to think. I didn't know if you were kind of speaking to like credential type information or. So one example that comes to mind is privacy settings. So actually, no, I'll use a simple one, say ID order. That's pretty universal. So you have, say you have some policy that's something that generates some entity, whether it's like posts and assigns IDs to them. And all it says is the things, things have unique IDs, but you know that actually they get IDs in sequential order. Something you never want to do, you never want to do is to compare to the IDs of two things. Say, if this thing came later, then it was made later. That's a never want to say, like, give me the most recent thing and sort by ID. If there's no timestamp or other thing that tells you that information, you you don't want to say, oh, I'm going to sort by ID and claim myself done. You want to say, I can't do this. Or if I do do this, then I'm making something very fragile and and to put a giant red sticker on it. That's a much more helpful yeah, example there. And now is that because, I mean, like if assuming that if you're working with like a typical database where you have it, where you have it set up to increment the number, you're saying it's not a reliable number to work off of. So if the thing breaks, you need to say if the thing breaks later because it changes. So like you switch from database to a distributed database, some kind of, you do some kind of sharding. Now things are not strictly increasing by a timestamp. You want to say, well, you know, just say, well, it's the, you know, the backend team's fault for suddenly before they went to quench order and now they're not. It's their fault for changing that. Mm-hmm. Or do you want to say front end team's fault for having assumed the first place that they were given sequence order? That makes sense. Or you need to later upgrade from like just an incremental ID to like a GUID or something. And then, and then I don't think you can sort that. <laughs> I mean, you could kind of have expectations like that kind of guide your fault behavior in the same way that's in actual legal contracts. They're like default things like you don't need to write it down. This thing does what it says it does in order for that to be. That's a default. You need to write it down that it doesn't. It might not do what it says it does, as you've probably seen a thousand software licenses. So like in, like in this case, like the fault for an ID is that just like it's an ID. It's unique. No other guarantees. If they don't say they're in increasing order then it's the person who assumes they are. It's their fault yeah. for using them that way. So for everybody listening, you should always be sorting by some sort of creation timestamp, possibly. But that definitely is it's a good point there. One of the things, one of the other topics I was looking forward to speaking with you about is I know that one of your new business ventures is up to speed, which I believe aims to help teams onboard developers faster. Could you provide our listeners with a little bit of background on what you're hoping to accomplish? Yes, yeah, so this is something that we just started working on and basically realized that this big problem of onboarding that we've heard from an, another multiple people we've talked to that at their company, it takes a new engineer six months to become a net positive, let alone mm-hmm. fully productive. And that's obviously massively costly. And, and in, in a lot of ways, a core problem here is about code base reading. That's like you start a new job, every task you do, it's like, I never prefer it's like, all right. So when it joined a new team, 
and it's like I spend like like one one day or two implementing the feature, and then two weeks reading other code and talking to people to make sure it won't break in unexpected ways. So, so our goal is to create the best system out there for learning a new code base. And how are you hoping to do that? Like, is that you thought it was an open ended question there? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just tell you like one of our one of our big ideas is when you dive into a new code base, it's often very hard and frustrating before it becomes fun and enjoyable. And that's because it starts off hardest and gets easiest. Like you look at a code base, like you look at a function that's modeled to what you want. And actually, you know, like you're trying to send emails to users, you look at the send email function, and actually it doesn't do that. It actually, you know, and queues something, sends it to the backend server that sends a different backend server. And then there's logging in there, there's permission checks, there's a million other things. And like you're just wanting to learn like like what kind of email did it send? Hmm. And like how does what's like the extending email part? So what you just encountered is a problem of sequencing. That's code that does different things is very intermixed. And it's often very hard to find a handle on what you can read first that you'll actually be able to understand and make and get that small win feeling. So one of the core ideas of what we're working on, still super duper early phases, is try to create a mapping between the ideas behind the code and where in the code they realized, and then also find the dependencies on them. And this can, at a minimum, help you read things in order. You can actually learn things instead of look a piece of code and like, there's 30 things going on here. I can't make anything out of this. Just I can, I can speak and re-experience very often my feeling looking at your code base. And as a level beyond that, uh, thanks to the, all the AI that's coming out, what we're just doing is sometimes our is no existing part of the code base you can look at it and just has a part you want plus things you already understand but nothing you don't understand but you can do things like you can um simplify away the edge cases you can believe the air handling just show you the happy path and mm -hmm. kind of simplify and make your own modified version of the code base that just has the parts that you need to learn and even if it's not the real thing it makes it far easier to come back later after you've learned a lot more and understand the real thing like reading a book as opposed to like decoding an ancient text mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I think one of the, you know, I talked to a lot of people about onboarding on the podcast and it's something that in my world, I deal with a lot with our team because we're always, we work on client projects as, as a consultancy. So we're, things come to us in a current state of, we may or may not have access to the previous developers or current developers or original developers. And it's been, or it's been passed around a bunch of different teams over the years. And so that context, that intent sometimes gets lost quite a bit. And then there's also another issue with a lot of code is that there might be code that it's in there, but it's not necessarily being used that much or could potentially be ripped out at some point. And there's some dead code or some functionality that's lightly used, but people, but you're new to the project. So you're not necessarily thinking like, is this safe to remove? Yeah. And you don't necessarily have anyone to ask. No. So it's like a tricky thing, I think, probably for any automated they, tools to make a, sense of. A, a, small, a small story I have that is uh, something that happened to IBM 10 or 20 I think they were 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. It was IBM Tangram. It starts with a T. Yeah, some other products, they, they looked some code and spotted a bug in it. I'm like, this looks really bad. And one of the engineers spent six months tracing down that bug and figuring out exactly what happened. He realized, well, it will only happen if this particular setting of Pyro Flags is set. And this particular setting of Pyro Flags is only set for old machines that we don't support anymore. I, this, th this thing is no longer relevant. We'll be back with our interview with Jimmy in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you for making time to listen to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these discussions valuable, please consider sharing a link amongst your peers and or writing a review on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. I think you can even do that in Spotify now. Also, is there someone you think I should be interviewing on Maintainable? Shoot me an email to Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm and state your case. And now let's get back to our interview with Jimmy Couple. spend six months on something that's actually not even needed to be worried about anymore is definitely a thing that happens. I'm curious about like if you're building some functionality or what's your take on like the current state of with your the tool that you're working on, uh, the product you're working on up to speed. And in terms of like now that a lot of say slightly larger organizations might have a collection of microservices and things interconnected and they're not all part of like the same Git repository. And so there's this, and the other thing I always think about with onboarding is that like a team might be bringing people in to work on the product, or the software project, but they might be coming in to be worked on different areas of the code base. And so the onboarding process might need to be a little bit unique depending on 
the skill level of the people coming in and where they're getting hired or what team they're getting assigned to within a large ecosystem of microservices or, or maybe it's a big monolith, but there's still a lot of like departmental type aspects to, to it. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think you're kind of, kind of getting at the tendencies of learning. Like, so there's a concept called push learning versus pull learning. Push learning is, so you say like, I want to start working in, uh, in React and so you go do a full course in React or read a book about it. And pull learning is like, I want to work on this specific website that uses React. And like every time you need to do something new, you haven't done before, you try to find some tutorial on that thing. And uh, they both have their time and place. I just think, think that humans tend to systematically have a systematic bias against systemic tend to focus on very short-term things. It's very hard to get the motivation to push learning, even when it actually is the most efficient for you in the time frame of one month or even one week. But anyway, that aside, it's like, so like, how do you not have someone like learn to learn code, cool code base, the piece they need for what, whatever the job is. And something that's, something that's really nice about having software starting to generate the onboard experience, that if we can get high accuracy at building this big graph of the ideas in your code and the dependencies mm -hmm. between them, then we, and also if if we can then have it look at a task and kind of and kind of guess of what things are needed then bam you have now have a learning path just geared towards what you need right now so we can actually do pull learning but with fewer of the downsides that come with pull learning traditionally hmm. in that sort of thing do you feel like there's this not too far off in the distant future where you know as people bring in new hires under their team and they're starting to work in a certain area they can interact with some ai-esque technology that will help them get up to speed with what they're kind of focusing on and then and rather than having to learn things that they're not going to be touching anytime soon and then to at least get that those small early wins and then uh, then they can continue to uncover different areas of the code base versus kind of setting up onboarding material that's kind of generalized for anyone that comes in the door yeah, 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 that's right. And it's just general fact that as things become more automated, there you're able to make them more tailored and personalized. One of the things we started doing with a couple of projects is we've set up like drip email campaigns for some projects. We're like, okay, so it's just like you even know, which is for a small internal team, it'll be like, all right, for the next four months, we're going to drip you some little details and just drop it in your inbox. Just here's some things to be aware of. And you can easily hit delete because you already know about it. But but those are very much coming out of a long history of like, we should probably, I want people to know these things, but they're not going to remember that they read it in our handbook the first couple of weeks when they started their job. But like, how do we reinforce these ideas or these concepts or point out areas of the code base that might be, hey, this is a really weird area of this one certain client project that might be useful to wrap your head around at some point. But I think it's like, how do you, Think about education, and it's one of the other things I want to talk about as well. Is this the work that you're doing at Mirden? But in terms of like training and bringing people up to speed, but also reinforcing ideas that they may or may not need to be aware of, but while keeping it kind of ambiently in their their space or their headspace in some ways, getting it to them somehow, even though it may not be like a short term thing that they're necessarily needing to be concerned about. Could you tell us a little bit about your work with Mirden? What types of Consulting or coaching services are you offering software engineering teams? Yes, Muradin is the code quality company, and we turn good software engineers to create ones by teaching them some of the software design things talking about today as far as like understanding how to, to make your code more resemble your high-level intent. But we do this with um, lots of examples drawn from real code bases and projects and a lot of exercise to help you really internalize it. So our flagship offering is the software design course, which you can hmm. find at yearning.com. And we get we get testimonials like like one person said they learned more from two weeks of the course than they had from two years of grad school. Oh, wow. You know, we people saying like they just go through the first lecture and it changes their idea of software. So like a really big niche is like once you pass beginner level, most of the things that you're that you'll find for software engineering are tech specific, and there's not really that much out there about mm. there about how to about how to write great code that's going to be maintainable and and less prone to bugs and less work for you and and others. And that's our hit the general big ideas past beginner level. Nice. I'll definitely include links to that in the show notes for people to so check out. And that was a software design course advanced software design course advanced okay find that in the show notes there a couple of quick last questions for you jimmy is there a non-programming non-technical book that you find yourself sure. recommending to people on a regular basis so there are a couple of learning science books that i bring up a lot 
Uh, the two books are Make It Stick and How Learning Works. Yeah, and so I think both of them are written by various uh, learning science professors, sometimes collaboration with just with just so um, not teachers. And how learning works is a less well known book, but it's very good. And there are and there were a number of like it introduced me to some whole areas about learning, and that's were like hugely important, really affected my thinking that I've not seen discussed in any of the other non-specialist writing about learning. As a little warning, do not confuse the book Make It Stick with Made It To Stick. Mm. Made to Made To Stick by the Heath Brothers is also a very good book, but it's about like marketing messaging, whereas Make It Stick is about learning. I've liked okay. them both, but that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. So okay, make this make it stick. I'm gonna look both of these books up. Something I'm curious about is how did you, was there a point, did you always know that you wanted to kind of be in an educational type of role in, in, in this type of field? Or is there, a, like, how, or was that something you felt like was early on in your, in your career or your life? Or like, I think I like to, I enjoy teaching people things or showing them things. No. or was so, something... so it's been in line with my mission, but the educational angle, something they did just kind of happen. So one of the greatest things that happened to me is that like a lot of people go through life searching for life purpose. And I basically woke up with it one day in about uh, May of 2010, which is I woke up one day and I realized the world does not know how to write good software. And I was thinking about like all the stories I've heard of endless software rewrites and delays, and just stuff not working and Y2K. And I thought I would make it my life mission to to make the role of software better and formally the goal of to reduce the global cost of software maintenance by a factor of 100. But the whole time, most of my career, I've been focused on the tool side. It's like, how do you write some, some really smart tool that's going to look at your code base, make it good for you, fix uh, the Y2K problem for you or more, or coming up next decade, fix the Unix epic problem for you and as well as more interesting changes. So I, my whole career has been focused on software tools. My first company, which was total failure, was automatically fixing bugs in other programs, program repair. It's such a good idea. It's going to be your fair was a bad business. <laughs> my PhD was on more the more meta level about not less about building specific program transformation tools, but how do you, once you build them, how do you make them more general? It's like, and it's like, how do you make your thing work in five languages instead of one? That was my master's thesis. But I came at the educational angle. It's kind of as at some point I was reading blog posts and I'm like, I, I was reading other people write blog posts about software uh, quality and design. Like, I'm just thinking, I understand this stuff way better than these bloggers. So why don't I do it? And then I was looking to start a business in grad school that was going to be more impactful than uh, just me writing some code on the side because I I was started off just doing you know it worked I just you know when grad school my first year is doing part time work for my former employer and you know it's realized that I can make way more impact not by being a good programmer but by making other people's good programmers. That's very uh, admirable of you. I'm curious about kind of get to this inflection point in your life and you're thinking I want to and specifically around you know wanting to reduce the maintenance cost of software by, I think you said a factor of a hundred. Do you have like a philosophical concern or thought around software development in terms of like trying to have like one of my missions is to help companies avoid rewrites or just mm -hmm. projects avoiding rewrites because I often feel like they're not really solving the underlying problem. And I'm like, you're, if you have the same team and they're going to use a new tech stack or something, are you really, is it a good decision just because you think it's going to be different next time around? Maybe, maybe not. Or is it, like, I always feel like there's this concern that like, well, we need to be, do away with the I'm air quoting the old and move over to this new thing. And we'll do all the things we were supposed to do right this time. But I always don't feel like that ends up necessarily manifest. The, the rewrites are problematic as themselves, but like, do they actually change their behavior as a team or how they think about what quality and keeping it maintainable going forward on that particular project? Like, how did you kind of come to this conclusion yourself? Conclusion about... About, about the world of software really sucking. <laughs> that seems relatively easy, I think, for people to wrap their head around. <laughs> I, th I think it's more of a, everybody else's code is horrible for the most part, right? And then, not, not necessarily true, but yeah. I think more in terms of like reducing that maintenance load on software projects, the long-term, uh, we need to go back and oh. do that kind okay. of stuff. Okay. Avoiding yeah. the rewrite. I definitely have a spiel there. Before I give there, I just want to share, recommend a blog post called this is on our Mirrodin's reading list that Mirrodin offers students. 
Herb Caudill, Lessons from Six Software Rewrite Stories, which is the common wisdom about never do a rewrite is too simplistic. There's some stories where it actually went very well. So the philosophical aim is that the world runs software. And when software is hard to change, so is the world. And as programmers, we are building the world. We are, we are some of the people creating the things around us. And you, you do not want to live in a world where all the buildings are physically rotting and all your devices don't work. And similarly, you do not want to live in a world where all your programs don't work, where there's really bad weather, and then suddenly the, all, an airline just cannot manage people for, for a full week. That happened last year with Southwest and their software. You do not want to live in a world where it's a... Uh, it hits, I think it was the year 2036, 2037, and lots of things stop working, or all new development has stopped for a few years as people remediate. And so it's like, you bet we like, you look at what we have around us compared to what we had 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Like, humanity has come so far in creating so many things. And like, we owe so many other people for having built great things that work, that can be updated, that other people can understand key building. And so we owe that to everyone else into the future. It's kind of a, a little bit of thought around and just appreciating the the amount of human time that has gone into the projects that we interact with. So I think there's always a little bit of like when software comes to, like say in my world, when it comes to me, I've always tried to be understanding that the developers that originally worked on this code base had a certain level of skill set, certain constraints that may or be, may not have been outside of their control. And I want to be empathetic towards them and at least acknowledge, like understand that they're I don't know the situation, how they, the code entirely got to be the way it is, but it is the way it is now. And I can't, we can't undo the past, but I think about like trying to think about how do we pick up the pieces and move it forward and iterate and improve things. And so that's why I like get to talk with people like you about this kind of stuff to get a sense of like how other people think about these challenges. Cause we, we don't always get to write the code the way we wanted to from day one, or some people don't even, as you said, don't even know what that might look like. Cause they haven't had a good experience of their skill levels only up to a certain point so far. Kind of quickly wrapping up last, you know, thanks for sharing these books. I'll definitely include links to them as well in the show notes for everybody. And is there, where can listeners best follow your thoughts and ruminations about software engineering online? Sure. On, so I have my blog, Path Sensitive, uh, Path, P-A-T-H, Sensitive, because spelled like the normal word, mm-hmm. no, uh, no, no hype and no space, pathsensitive.com. It's my blog where I write about a number of topics, but primarily about advanced software design ideas, like... You know, what is abstraction? That's uh, and what is abstraction on uh, maybe things I've talked about today, the 11 aspects of good code. Sometimes I write about other things. I have a new blog post coming up soon about why the vitamins versus painkillers metaphor is totally wrong because vitamins actually outsell painkillers three to one. Uh, I also sometimes tweet at uh, Jimmy Couple. That's uh, so sometimes I have to put actual content there. It's like, you know, like there's a video that came out uh, early this year, not too long not I think that long ago about composition versus inheritance. And then I gave like a 20 tweet thread trying mm-hmm. to explain like how what he's saying corresponds to the actual type of objects and about why the video is totally wrong. So, I do, so sometimes I post a lot of deep software engineering content there. Sometimes just make jokes about category theory. It's like, I used to think free objects, category theory ideas like free objects were useless. Then I found Craigslist. Now I use free objects every day. Well, great. I will definitely include links to those for people in the show notes as well. And with that, it's been such a delight having you join us on Maintainable, Jimmy. Thank you so much for stopping by to talk shop. It's been a delight to be here. Awesome. Thanks again. Oh, oh, oh.